In the vast tapestry of human belief and mythology, few figures are as enigmatic and profoundly influential as Enoch. Welcome to a groundbreaking documentary by Myth Vision Podcast, where we delve into the ancient narratives that predate and pave the way for the Judean tradition of this mystic. From the windswept plains of Mesopotamia to the scrolls of the ancients, we unravel the stories of Etana and Adapa, the earliest known myths that form the bedrock of Enoch's legend. Join us on a journey through time as we explore the depths of these ancient tales, guided by the illuminating research of Dr. Seth L. Sanders and his pivotal work, Adapa to Enoch. With each layer we uncover, you'll gain a deeper understanding of how these primordial stories echo through the ages, shaping the figure of Enoch and his enduring legacy. This documentary is an essential odyssey for anyone eager to truly comprehend the origins and impact of one of the most enigmatic figures in religious history. Remember to like and subscribe to Myth Vision Podcast on YouTube to stay updated with every revelation we uncover. Engage with us, join the conversation in the comment section, and become part of the community seeking knowledge and understanding. Don't miss this profound journey into the past where myth and history converge to reveal the roots of Enoch. Ascent of Kings. Diving into the ancient texts of Mesopotamia is like embarking on a scholarly quest for the ultimate cosmic library. Imagine chatting with the deities who drafted destiny itself across the sky. What mind-bending secrets could you uncover from such celestial scribes? This journey isn't just a fanciful tale. It reflects how the old-time intellectuals of Mesopotamia dreamt of knowledge and how their dreams evolved. Were the heroes of these narratives humble shepherds, mighty kings, or wise sages? What profound transformations did they undergo? And what treasures of wisdom did they bring back to Earth? And how did their stories morph over time? popping up in spells, or being retold in fresh, intriguing versions. Understanding these heavenly expeditions is crucial, not just for grasping how these ancient scholars viewed themselves in their long-standing cuneiform tradition, but also for seeing how they adapted to a newer, more diverse Aramaic tradition shared with Jewish scholars during and after the Babylonian era. At the heart of this exploration are questions about the nature and content of this intellectual exchange. For instance, while some researchers studying Aramaic texts see the legendary Mesopotamian king Enmiduranki as the archetype of cosmic knowledge gained from a divine voyage, Assyriologists often spotlight Adapa and the Apkalu as the true models of celestial wisdom. The concept of a heavenly journey and its revealed knowledge held profound significance for Mesopotamian scholars. This documentary offers a fresh analysis of Mesopotamian texts and iconography related to the ascent to heaven, tracing its evolution from the earliest to the latest sources and placing them within their historical contexts. Previous studies have often focused on specific aspects, such as literary interpretations of the Adapa myths or theories regarding Enmeduranki and Enoch. In contrast, this video aims to provide a comprehensive historical perspective on how Mesopotamian scholars themselves conceptualized and engaged with the idea of heavenly ascent in both theory and ritual practice. We'll explore the various depictions of the heavenly journey that were prevalent during different periods, particularly during the Babylonian and Second Temple periods, and examine how scholars of those times adapted and invoked their inherited texts and themes under new historical conditions. The narrative of Mesopotamian traditions concerning heavenly ascent reveals a shift from a focus on kings, epitomized by early myths and references to the celestial journeys of figures like Etana and the Ur III kings Shulgi and Ishbi era, to a later emphasis on sages and the transformation of royal power into scholarly ritual. This transition reflects a broader evolution in the way knowledge and divine interaction were conceptualized, moving from the domain of royal power to the realm of scholarly pursuit. 
Through this exploration, we aim to understand not just the imagery and ideas associated with heavenly ascent, but also what these concepts meant for the scholars who pondered, wrote about, and enacted these celestial journeys. Adapa emerges as a central character in Mesopotamian lore, symbolizing the zenith of heavenly journeys within their scribal culture. His story is referenced in a striking variety of at least 34 texts spanning from the Old Babylonian to the Hellenistic periods, initially appearing in the Old Babylonian era, circa 1894-1595 BC. The myth of Adapa's ascent to the heavens marks a seminal shift in the narrative of celestial journeys. As time progresses, especially in the first millennium, the narrative of Adapa gains prominence while earlier figures like Etana recede into the background. From the outset, Adapa is not just a mythical figure, but an active presence in the rituals of exorcists who invoke or embody him during the Old Babylonian period. As the centuries unfold, his significance only grows. By the first millennium, Adapa is not merely a sage, but a symbol of ultimate judgment and skill, invoked repeatedly by scholars and kings alike. This marks a significant evolution from the earlier heavenly ascents, which were primarily undertaken by kings seeking to establish dynasties. By the Neo-Assyrian period, it is the scholars, not the kings, who embark on these celestial journeys, seeking not just power, but profound knowledge and ritualistic prowess. The narrative of Adapa further evolves after the rise of the Persian Empire and the cessation of native Mesopotamian kingship. He transcends the purely mythological and ritualistic spheres, stepping into the historical and political arenas as he is featured in king lists and monumental inscriptions. This evolution of Adapa's role from a mythic figure to a symbol invoked across various domains, illustrates the dynamic nature of Mesopotamian intellectual and cultural traditions, reflecting a deep-seated belief in the power of knowledge and the scholarly pursuit of truth and order in the cosmos. Etana. The Ascents of Kings section begins with the tale of Etana, one of the earliest and most captivating stories of celestial ascension from the ancient Near East. This Sumerian king's legendary journey was not just an adventurous flight to the heavens, but a quest driven by his desire for an heir. He embarked on this perilous voyage aboard an eagle, seeking a mystical plant believed to bestow fertility. The narrative intertwines with a moral folktale of an eagle and a snake. Initially, allies, the eagle betrays the snake, leading to its own downfall. In its time of need, Etana offers salvation, and the grateful eagle repays this kindness by becoming his steed to the skies. Interestingly, evidence suggests that Etana's story might have been a popular folktale even before it was chronicled in written form, as early seals depict scenes reminiscent of his journey. However, when the tale is finally put to tablet, it becomes more than a mere adventure. It symbolizes the divine right and the continuity of kingship. Etana's quest for celestial aid is linked with the legitimacy and perpetuation of his rule. Beyond the myth, Etana's legacy continued to evolve. By the old Babylonian period, he had transitioned from a mythic hero to a revered ancestral king, and even into an underworld figure, mentioned alongside the epic hero Gilgamesh in various rituals. Yet, as the first millennium BCE unfolded, Etana's presence in literature and ritual began to wane. Despite the occasional copying of his story during the Neo-Assyrian period, references and ritualistic invocations of Etana significantly diminished, signaling a shift in the cultural and religious landscape of Mesopotamia. This decline in Etana's prominence marks the evolving perspectives and priorities of Mesopotamian society, where once celebrated tales and figures could fade, giving way to new ideologies and icons. 
The Atana myth, with its vivid depiction of a king's heavenly ascent on an eagle's back, resonates beyond its Mesopotamian origins, sharing similarities with a range of stories from classical, Persian, Islamic, and even 20th century Finnish cultures. This widespread motif of a hero's flight underscores a crucial point about the nature of ancient narratives. They often transcend their immediate cultural and historical contexts, echoing universal themes and motifs. Such parallels highlight that while narratives may appear similar, literary resemblance alone doesn't necessarily indicate a direct historical or cultural connection. The Finnish and Islamic versions of this motif, for example, can be described in ways that closely mirror the Mesopotamian account, reminding us that the significance of a narrative is not just in its content, but in what it meant to the people who told it and heard it over time. The Atana story stands out in early Mesopotamian culture not just for its narrative content, but also because it's reflected in the art of the period, particularly in Akkad period seals. These seals provide the earliest visual representation of the myth, depicting a consistent and detailed scene. A pastoral setting where men are engaged in making cheese, a man ascending to the heavens on an eagle, and two dogs, along with shepherds, witnessing this extraordinary event. The presence of this scene on seals indicates that by the Sargonic period, the story of a shepherd's celestial journey was not only known, but also popular enough to be depicted in everyday objects. This visual representation, coupled with the narrative, offers a richer understanding of the myth's place in Mesopotamian culture, suggesting that it was more than just a story. It was a shared cultural touchstone that spoke to universal themes of aspiration, exploration, and the quest for divine wisdom or intervention. Itana's first written mention in the Sumerian King List, dating back to the Ur III period, situates him in a unique historical and mythological context. Positioned as the 11th king after a great flood, he follows a series of rulers with seemingly mythical names, such as Kulasina Bel, which translates to all of them are ruler. This suggests a pre-monarchical era or a time of diffuse leadership rather than a single sovereign. In this lineage, Itana is the seventh king of the second series of rulers, marking a significant transition. He stands out as potentially the first real ruler amidst the preceding mythical names, signifying a shift toward a more historical and recognizable form of kingship. His characterization as a shepherd aligns with the pastoral origins of many ancient Near Eastern societies and symbolizes his role in guiding and unifying his people. His most distinctive act, ascending to heaven, further elevates his status, intertwining his earthly reign with a divine or supernatural aspect. This ascent not only underscores his quest for personal solutions, like seeking an heir, but also symbolizes his extraordinary qualities as a leader capable of transcending the earthly realm and interacting with the divine. Through this narrative, Itana becomes a foundational figure, representing the melding of myth and emerging historical consciousness in early Mesopotamian civilization. Itana, a shepherd who went to heaven, who consolidated all lands, became king and reigned for 1,500 years. Bali, son of Itana, reigned 400 years. Sumerian King's List Atana's heavenly ascent, whether tied to the origins of kingship or his quest for an heir, as recounted in later versions of the myth, underscores his unique place in the Sumerian King List. As the seventh king of Kish, he aligns with other significant figures like Adapa and Enmeduranki who are also often positioned as the seventh. In their respective sequences, a number that may carry symbolic importance, denoting wisdom or a special connection to the divine. This placement in the list reflects a synthesis of narratives. Itana, the shepherd, and Itana, the founding king, emerged into a single figure, a unifier, and a pioneer of kingship. 
This merging also indicates an expansion upon the older story depicted in the seals, blending Atana's pastoral roots with his regal, mythic ascent to the heavens. The myth itself is known from texts spanning the Old Babylonian, Middle Babylonian, and Neo-Assyrian periods, each offering variations of the story. The existence of these different versions across time doesn't necessarily indicate a linear evolution of the narrative, but rather points to the existence of parallel editions and interpretations reflecting diverse scribal traditions and cultural values. In the Old Babylonian version, the myth is explicitly linked to the origins of kingship. This connection perhaps serves to legitimize and exalt the concept of monarchy by associating it with a divine or supernatural journey, implying that the institution of kingship has heavenly approval or origins. This narrative choice highlights the enduring significance of Atana's story in Mesopotamian culture, not just as a mythic adventure, but as a foundational legend that helped to define and understand the nature of kingship and authority in the ancient world. The great god the Anunna who decree fate sat to deliberate about the land, the creators of the world, the establishers of creation. The divine Igigi decreed the festival of kingship for the people, but a king they had not yet established among the many peoples. At that time, headcloth and crown were unworn, nor was scepter inlaid with lapis. Not a single throne dais was built. Sevenfold were the gates bolted against the valiant scepter and crown. Headcloth and staff lay before Anum in heaven. There was no ruler for the people. Kingship came down from heaven. Ishtar looked for a king. Text breaks. Old Babylonian kings list. In the old Babylonian rendition of the Itana myth, he is depicted as the inaugural king, diverging from the sequence presented in the Sumerian king list. This version places a clear emphasis on Etana's adventures, marking them as the narrative's central theme. A significant line in this version echoes the language of the Sumerian king list, using the phrase, Kingship descended from heaven. This phrase not only links Atana's story to the celestial origin of kingship, but also reflects the belief that sovereignty itself is a divine mandate, embodied in sacred objects of ritual and political importance that reside in heaven. Under the watchful eye of the god Anum, the text mentions gates bolted seven times, symbolizing the barriers between the earthly realm and the divine right of kingship, awaiting a worthy ruler to unlock them. By the time of the Neo-Assyrian Nineveh version, the text reflects deeper contemplation and reinterpretation by scribes. This version introduces additional lines that preface Etana's selection as a ruler. Etana is once again referred to as a shepherd, but the term is employed as a political metaphor, suggesting a herder of people rather than just sheep. This metaphorical language was a common way to describe kings, implying their role as guides and protectors of their subjects. The Nineveh version seems to deliberately play with both the literal and figurative meanings of shepherd, suggesting that Atana transitioned from being a literal shepherd of sheep to a metaphorical shepherd of people. The evolution of the text over time, from the Old Babylonian to the Neo-Assyrian periods, indicates that scribes continuously engaged with and reinterpreted Atana's story as their own conceptions of kingship and sovereignty evolved. This ongoing reflection and adaptation highlight the dynamic nature of Mesopotamian literary and cultural traditions, where ancient myths were not static relics, but living narratives continually reshaped to reflect the changing values, beliefs, and political realities of the times. After Atana is made king, he faces a personal crisis. His wife is unable to conceive due to an illness. In a dream, however, she envisions a plant of birth that promises fertility. Etana, desperate to find this mystical plant, prays to the sun god Shamash to reveal its location, just as it was shown to his wife in her dream. This sets the stage for Etana's quest and intertwines his fate with that of two animal companions, a snake and an eagle, who form a pact 
under the watchful eye of Shamash. The oath they swear is sacred, enforced by the threat of divine retribution should either violate it. The curse specifically mentions being denied entrance to the mountain land, a crucial area for hunting and thus survival. However, the eagle betrays this trust, consuming the snake's young in a cruel breach of their agreement. Seeking to escape the inevitable revenge, the eagle conceives a plan to ascend to the heavens. The betrayed snake, seeking justice, turns to Shamash. The god advises a cunning trap in the mountains, where the snake can incapacitate the eagle, stripping it of its ability to fly and casting it into a pit. In its misery, the eagle too calls out to Shamash, who, in a turn of events, decides to intertwine the eagle's fate with Etana's. Meanwhile, Etana is in a state of despair, having exhausted all his resources and offerings in seeking Shamash's aid for his predicament. He laments the extensive sacrifices he has made, indicating his deep frustration and desperation. Shamash finally responds to Etana's prayers, instructing him to follow the same path to the mountains that the eagle had taken. This directive sets the stage for Etana's and the eagle's paths to cross, linking their destinies and propelling them towards the Sharad goal of reaching the heavens. Through this intricate interweaving of human and divine, animal and supernatural, the myth of Etana explores themes of betrayal, retribution, desperation, and the pursuit of redemption and hope, all under the gaze of the gods who guide the fate of all beings. The encounter between Etana and the eagle in the mountains becomes a pivotal moment, a literal answer to their prayers. As Etana rescues the eagle from the pit and aids in the repair of its wings, the story delves into themes of restoration and mutual dependence. The eagle, once a powerful creature of the skies, now requires the help of a human, possibly even a specific substance, Ieru, that shares a name with the word for eagle to regain its ability to fly. Similarly, Etana, a king on earth, finds himself in need of the eagle to ascend to the heavens on its back to obtain the plant of birth, hoping to cure his wife's barrenness and secure his lineage. The narrative cleverly plays on the word Iru, creating a linguistic and thematic link between the eagle, Iru, the substance possibly needed for its flight, and the concept of fertility and pregnancy, also Iru. This linguistic play adds depth to the story, highlighting the interconnectedness and interdependence of all elements within the myth. However, the path forward is not straightforward. Itana implores the eagle to open his eyes and locate the plant of birth, but the eagle admits ignorance of its whereabouts. The solution to their dilemma comes through divine intervention. The eagle receives guidance in a dream, a common motif in Mesopotamian narratives where dreams serve as a medium for divine communication. The dream reveals that their journey is not to the wilderness or earthly realms, but to the heavens themselves where they will seek an audience with a goddess. This revelation sets the stage for the next phase of their adventure, where the earthly and the divine will meet. The story of Etana and the eagle becomes more than a quest for personal gain. It's a journey into the unknown, a test of faith and courage, and a quest for divine wisdom and intervention. The Nineveh version of the text, reflecting later Neo-Assyrian understandings and interpretations, continues this tale of aspiration, desperation, and the hope of divine benevolence benevolence, capturing the imagination and spiritual yearnings of the Mesopotamian people. The eagle spoke up and said to Etana, My friend, that god showed me a dream. We passed through the entrance of the gates of Anam, Enlil, and Ea. We bowed down together, you and I. We passed through the entrance of the gates of Sin, Shamash, Adad, and Ishtar. We bowed down together, you and I. I saw a house with windows, a seal I pushed aside and entered. Seated inside was a young woman, awesomely crowned, her features beautiful. A throne was set up and the ground was trodden down. At the base of the throne, fierce lions lay. As I approached, the lions sprang at me. 
I started up in terror. The narrative of Atana's ascent to heaven intriguingly parallels another famous Mesopotamian journey, the descent of deities like Inanna, Ishtar, and Nergal into the netherworld. Both journeys involve traversing through seven gates, a number often associated with completeness or the divine in ancient Near Eastern symbolism. This symmetry is not just a narrative device, but a reflection of the Mesopotamian worldview, where the cosmos is mirrored above and below, with heaven and the underworld serving as dual realms of divine encounter and transformation. The oath sworn by the snake and the eagle underscores this parallel, while the phrase Nereb Shadu directly refers to the entrance to the mountains. The word Shadu also connotes the netherworld. In Mesopotamian belief, a spirit denied entry into the netherworld is condemned to wander the earth in torment. Etana and the eagle's journey to heaven involves passing a Nerebu, a threshold similar to the gates of the underworld. By juxtaposing Nereb Shau, entrance to the mountains or underworld, with Nereb Shameh, entrance to heaven, the narrative emphasizes the contrast and connection between these cosmic realms. The story also highlights the prophetic nature of dreams in Mesopotamian culture. The eagle's dream filled with fear, yet delivering a crucial message aligns with other Mesopotamian narratives like Dumuzi's dream or the seventh tablet of Gilgamesh where dreams serve as portent or guide. These dreams aren't just personal experiences, but are often laden with broader cosmic or divine significance. References to Atana's death and his afterlife as a netherworld hero further complicate his character. A fragment of the text speaks of his ghost a death like Etana, suggesting his journey and fate resonated beyond his celestial ascent, perhaps becoming a metaphor for the human condition or the quest for immortality. This aspect of Etana as a netherworld figure persists in literary references outside the ascent myth highlighting his multifaceted role in Mesopotamian mythology as both a celestial voyager and an underworld presence. The Atana story's meaning to its ancient readers likely varied, reflecting its multiple versions and interpretations over time. This multiplicity suggests that the narrative was flexible, adaptable, and subject to reinterpretation based on the changing needs, beliefs, and contexts of the audience and the scribes. Internally, the text the text itself provides clues to its evolution and reinterpretation. For example, the late version's introduction implies that the old Babylonian version was either misunderstood or deliberately rethought, indicating a dynamic relationship with the narrative. The text was not static. Instead, it was a living story, continually reshaped to resonate with new audiences and integrate with other mythic themes. This practice of rereading and rewriting suggests that the story was significant enough to warrant such sustained engagement and adaptation. The introductions to the text also offer insight into how it was intended to be read. They emphasize the themes of the first king, the founding of kingship, and the heavenly origin of kingship. This indicates that the story was seen as foundational, not just as a myth, but as a narrative with political and cultural significance, linking the institution of kingship directly with the divine. Externally, Itana's roles and representations in other texts highlight his multifaceted significance in Mesopotamian culture. In the Sumerian king list and the ballad of former kings, he is portrayed as a primordial king, emphasizing his status as a foundational figure in the mythic past. However, he also takes on a role as an underworld ruler in various funerary and incantation texts, as well as in the standard Babylonian version of Gilgamesh. This duality suggests that Etana was seen not just as a historical or mythical ruler, but as a liminal figure navigating between life and death, earth and heaven. The divinization of Etana, indicated by the use of the divine determinative in writing his name in the late version, further underscores his complex status. He joins figures like Dumuzi and Ningish Zida, who exist in both heaven and the underworld, and Gilgamesh, who narrowly escapes death only to 
become associated with it. These associations suggest that Etana was seen as more than a king. He was a symbol of the human quest for knowledge, power, and immortality, and the ways in which these quests intersect with the divine and the afterlife. Atana's primary role within Mesopotamian scribal culture was that of a legendary founding king celebrated for his daring adventures and his significant position in the underworld. He was a figure whose narrative extended beyond the realm of mythology and into the practical and spiritual aspects of Mesopotamian life. In the second millennium, he was invoked in funerary texts and incantations, called upon for assistance as a ruler of the netherworld. Much like the epic hero Gilgamesh. These rituals indicate that Etana was not merely a character from a bygone era, but a potent symbol and spiritual presence, believed to possess the power to aid the living and the dead. However, Etana's presence in later periods diminishes. He is not mentioned in letters or inscriptions, and his legacy seems confined to lists and historical accounts. This suggests that while Etana's story and his journey to heaven once held significant cultural and religious weight, over time, Time, his relevance faded, and he became a figure of the past, remembered more for his mythic journey than his continued influence. The narrative of Atana is essentially a royal myth with a critical message about the nature of sovereignty. The secret that Etana brings down from heaven is not a simple object or piece of knowledge, but the very concept of kingship itself, a divine mandate or blessing that legitimizes and empowers earthly rulers. This theme resonates with broader Mesopotamian beliefs about the connection between the divine and the royal, where kingship is often portrayed as a gift from the gods, and kings are seen as intermediaries between the heavens and the earth. While the Traditions surrounding supernatural sages like Adapa or the Apkalu continue through a more extended history and are integrated into various aspects of ritual and culture. The narratives of King's heavenly ascents, like that of Atana, during the Earth 3 period have a more concise historical arc. However, the impact of these stories is profound, suggesting deep-seated beliefs about the divine right of kings, the origins of power, and and the role of rulers in bridging the celestial and terrestrial realms. Through Etana's story and others like it, Mesopotamian culture expressed its understanding of the cosmos, authority, and the human quest for knowledge and power. The skyward journey of royalty during ancient Mesopotamia's Ur the Third and Isin Eras, circa 21st century BCE. Intriguingly, the first mentions of a royal climb to the cosmos in ancient Mesopotamia are not found in mythical tales or regal chronicles, but in the mundane ledgers of commerce. A financial document from the Earth for era notes allocations made when King Shulgi soared to the stars. There, a group of female slaves work of 142 one three female slave days. On the day when Shulgi ascended to heaven and was released, was withdrawn against Anana. The dating notation, indicating the 48th year and 11th month of Shulgi's reign, intriguingly suggests these events occurred posthumously. This depiction of Shulgi's afterlife elevation to a celestial abode marks a unique instance of a monarch metamorphosing into a star. A subsequent illustration of kingly celestial ascent is documented shortly thereafter in an economic account related to Ishbi era. This particular record itemizes resources allocated for a grand morning ceremony commemorating the monarch's ascension. This peculiar trend of noting heavenly ascents in date-stamped financial documents should be considered alongside the broader theme of divine status granted to rulers during the Ur-3 and Isin dynasties. Initially under Naram Sin in the Akkadian era, and later beginning with Shulgi, Sumerian sovereigns started to adopt divine epithets, as evidenced by the holy symbol prefixed to their names and other godly ceremonial roles they undertook, including being the subject of hymns. Starting with Shulgi, it might have been customary to view each king through the Isin dynasty as having taken their place in the heavens post-mortem. Shulgi, in particular, enjoys a distinctive status, being acknowledged as a star constellation in additional texts. Since these accounts don't merely relay myths, but detail official state rituals, they offer a rare and valuable glimpse into the tangible ways religious belief and political ideology were interwoven during the Ur-3 and 
and Eason epochs. This singular one-way journey to the afterlife, noted in the economic records for Shulgi and Ishbi era, stands alone within the broader collection ancient Mesopotamian texts and traditions. Dr. Steinkeller's 2013 study offers a credible interpretation of the rituals surrounding these ascents, drawing parallels with the more thoroughly recorded funeral rites of Ur-3's King Shusuan. In contrast, other known instances of humans ascending to the heavens in Mesopotamian lore typically involve a temporary visitation aimed at altering divine decrees or the fate of the visitor, as seen in the stories of Adapa and Atana. These narratives often link celestial journeys with royalty, but are distinct from the irreversible divine ascent of Shulgi and Ishbi era. The tale of Atana, for example, is maintained in a literary format emphasizing its mythic nature, whereas the ascension of these divinized kings is framed as a factual occurrence, with its costs and timing meticulously recorded, lending it a unique form of historical and economic legitimacy. This portrayal as a historical event imbues the ascension with a sense of official reality akin to that of any state ceremony, marking it as a unique phenomenon in Mesopotamian records. Later historical texts from the region do reincorporate the motif of ascension for political ends, often featuring a wise figure as the protagonist, yet none carry the same public and state-sanctioned weight as the ascensions of Shulgi and Ishbi era, the god Dumuzi ascending. The Ascent narrative takes an intriguing turn with Dumuzi, a figure who transcends mortal kingship to achieve divine status. In Mesopotamian lore, Dumuzi is the exceptional royal entity who is depicted as ascending to the heavens, a journey documented in two notable instances within the region's vast literary canon. The first of these instances is encapsulated in a hymn dedicated to Inanna, a deity intimately tied to Dumuzi's mythos. While the exact dating of this text remains uncertain, its thematic and stylistic elements suggest it originated sometime between the Ur-3 and Old Babylonian periods, indicating a continuity of the ascent motif over centuries. Dumuzi's unique narrative, blending human origins with divine destiny, adds a complex layer to the Mesopotamian understanding of the afterlife and the divine realm. O oh, maid, station him for me at the sky. Station for me at the sky, the greatest of wild oxen. Station Dumuzi for me at the sky. Station for me at the sky, the greatest of wild oxen. In the face of Dumuzi's impending demise, a poignant plea emerges within the narrative. Inanna, a goddess deeply connected to Dumuzi, calls upon her own mother, Ningal, and Dumuzi's mother, Zertor. The poetic structure of the text alternates between these two maternal figures, reflecting a rhythmic appeal to place Dumuzi among the stars, possibly as a constellation. This proposed celestial elevation of Dumuzi mirrors the one-way ascension of Shulgi, yet it's crucial to recognize that Dumuzi's ascent is not presented as an accomplished reality, but rather as a fervent wish amidst the shadow of his mortality. The text stops short of confirming his ascent, leaving it as a hopeful vision rather than a reported event. The second mention of Dumuzi's presence in the heavens is found in the myth of Adapa, a narrative preserved in both Old Babylonian Sumerian and later Akkadian versions. This account seems to subtly acknowledge the potential success of Inanna's plea. Adapa, upon his arrival in the celestial realm, is informed that he will encounter Dumuzi there, indicating that Dumuzi is acknowledged in the afterlife. The story suggests a ritualistic mourning for Dumuzi, akin to grieving for a deceased deity. In this heavenly setting, Dumuzi assumes the role of a doorkeeper, a position reminiscent of Itana's duties in the netherworld. This portrayal reinforces the idea of Dumuzi's transformed state from a once mortal king to a divine figure with specific responsibilities in the afterlife, reflecting the intricate interplay between myth, ritual, and the conceptualization of divinity in ancient Mesopotamian culture, the ascent of the sage Adapa. 
In the rich picture of Mesopotamian intellectual history, the story of Adapa stands out as the most enduring and widespread narrative among ancient scribes. Adapa, a legendary figure, is more than just a prominent character. He is the quintessential symbol of wisdom and expertise in language and ritual for Mesopotamian scribes. His story is not just a myth, it represents the zenith of scholarly achievement and is central to understanding the cultural and intellectual milieu of the time. Adapa's influence permeated the very core of Mesopotamian scholarly practice, particularly evident in the long standing incantation series known as Udug Dahul, Evil Demons. In these incantations, scribes would assert their authority and challenge malevolent forces by invoking Adapa's name, claiming, I am Adapa. This practice, which spanned approximately 2,000 years, underscores the deep-seated reverence and identification scribes had with Adapa's wisdom and power. From the old Babylonian period onward, Adapa's popularity surged making him arguably the most renowned sage by the first millennium. His significance is further highlighted in key texts like the Babylonian temple handbook Tintir, where he is mentioned right after the mighty god Marduk. The breadth of Adapa's influence is seen in the diversity of genres and texts that feature him, ranging from letters and royal monuments to incantations, handbooks, catalogs, and narratives. This widespread representation across various forms of written culture is unparalleled, making Adapa a unique and vital figure for understanding the broader context of Mesopotamia Mesopotamian intellectual and cultural practices. The complexity and pervasiveness of Adapa's role in Mesopotamian literature make him a challenging subject to study comprehensively. Yet, this very complexity is what renders him an essential figure for scholars seeking to grasp the nuances of Mesopotamian scribal culture. Unlike other mythic or historical figures who might appear in a limited set of texts, Adapa's story evolves and adapts over time, reflecting the changing needs, audiences, and objectives of the scribes who revered him. His presence across a wide array of literary forms indicates not just his importance, but also the dynamic and evolving nature of Mesopotamian scholarship and culture. In the field of Assyriology, researchers have traditionally devoted much attention to the detailed examination of the Adapa myth, often focusing on the text itself rather than considering the broader context of how it was interpreted and understood by ancient Mesopotamian scholars. This approach has resulted in a diverse array of modern interpretations, which is fitting given the inherent richness and ambiguity of the Adapa story. The myth is recognized as a multifaceted literary piece that not only allows, but also seems to invite multiple interpretations. The text of the Adapa myth and the traditions surrounding it show evidence of evolution and reinterpretation over time. This indicates that the story was not static, but was continually adapted and re-understood by those who read and used it. It's not that the myth lacks a specific meaning. Rather, it's that its meaning and the role of Adapa himself varied over time and context. Adapa's enduring relevance and significance in Mesopotamian scholarly tradition suggest that he represented more than a single idea or concept to the scholars of the time. His significance was multifaceted and dynamic, reflecting the changing needs, interpretations, and intellectual currents of Mesopotamian society. This study aims to delve into the interpretive and practical aspects of Adapa's role, focusing on what he symbolized to ancient Mesopotamian sages. It builds on the foundational work of Dr. Piccioni's 1981 Italian edition, which compiled many of the non-narrative mentions of Adapa. While Piccioni's work laid the textual groundwork for understanding historical uses of Adapa in Mesopotamia, it hasn't been thoroughly analyzed especially not in English. This research seeks to fill that gap by examining Adapa within the cultural context of ancient Mesopotamia. Rather than relying on speculative reconstructions, this approach aims to provide solid evidence of how Adapa's roles evolved and how these changes aligned with broader shifts in Mesopotamian history and ideology. 
From the earliest sources, Adapa is portrayed as a master of language and ritual, whose potent speech can threaten demons and gods alike. To understand Adapa's origins and enduring influence, the study will first explore his roots in the Old Babylonian period, focusing on two texts, the Sumerian precursors to the Sekul, Uduk Dathul, incantations, and the myth of Adapa and the South Wind. These works help establish his role and significance for nearly two millennia, given the vast and varied later sources about Adapa, this research will organize the materials by genre. This categorization will enable a clearer analysis of how Adapa's portrayal and significance shifted over time and how these changes corresponded with the evolving genres of Mesopotamian literature, such as monumental inscriptions and historical records. This genre-based approach will also reflect how Adapa's image and use were influenced by the changing political landscapes and fortunes of the first millennium empires. Through this comprehensive examination, the study aims to provide a nuanced understanding of Adapa's multifaceted role in Mesopotamian intellectual and cultural history. The earliest rituals and myths about Adapa, Old Babylonian, period C, 1800-1600 BCE. The most ancient ritual mention of Adapa is found within an old Babylonian Sumerian incantation originating from Nippur. Although the original text is damaged and fragmented, scholars are able to reconstruct its content with a high degree of confidence thanks to closely related texts from later periods that provide parallel. These later parallels offer insights into the text's original form and content, allowing modern researchers to piece together and understand the significance of Adapa in this early ritual context. The Earth Lords, the Earth Ladies, Enkum and Ninkum. I am a Dapa Sage of Eridu. I am the man of Asaluhi, to cure the man in his illness. Enki, the Great Lord, sent me. By the time of the Old Babylonian period, Adapa had already begun to assume a central role in the activities of Mesopotamian scribes, particularly in the realm of exorcism and ritual. This significance is underscored by his mention in the Udug Hul, Evil Demons, texts which are among the oldest and most enduring Mesopotamian ritual series. The mention of Adapa in these texts is not only historically significant for being the earliest known ritual reference to him, but also because it connects to the very last known instances of such texts stretching all the way to the first century AD. This enduring relevance highlights Adapa's deep-rooted importance in Mesopotamian scholarly and ritual practices. The inclusion of Adapa in Udughul is part of a broader trend of curating and compiling rituals into comprehensive collections, a practice that began in the old Babylonian period and continued for centuries. These collections were not merely academic, they were practical tools for scribes and exorcists used in combating the demonic forces believed to cause disease and misfortune. The rituals within these texts, including those involving Adapa, were part of a living tradition, continually edited and updated to meet the needs of the time. The narrative of Adapa and the mythological elements within the Udughul text share key features, especially in their earliest forms. In both the incantation and the myth, Adapa is depicted as a powerful ritualist hailing from Eridu, the city of Enki, the god of magic and secret knowledge. This association with Enki and Eridu enhances Adapa's stature as a figure capable of confronting and controlling supernatural forces. Notably, in the ritual texts, the practitioner performing the incantation claims to be Adapa, embodying his role and power. This practice of self-predication, where the exorcist identifies with a supernatural entity like Adapa or an Apkalu, a sage or demigod, is a common feature in early versions of these texts. It illustrates the deep personal and professional connection Mesopotamian scholars felt with Adapa, viewing him not just as a mythic figure, but as a potent and accessible persona to embody and channel in their ritual practices. The Myth of Adapa and the South Wind. This ancient narrative, one of the most detailed and compelling from the realms of Mesopotamia, 
Mesopotamian lore has been intertwined with mystical rituals since its inception. The earliest rendition, a Sumerian masterpiece from the old Babylonian era discovered at Tel Hadad, is more than a mere tale. It culminates with a powerful incantation where the deity Enki addresses the south wind, transforming the story into a historiola, a myth with a purpose aimed at combating the demons of disease. From the moment we delve into its lines, it's clear that this isn't just literary artistry. It's a magical medical narrative akin to the ancient spells of Udug Hul. Interestingly, this Sumerian version also includes a lengthy prologue, setting the story in a time before time, a feature missing in its later retellings. The Middle Babylonian version, found in far-off Egypt's Amarna, is more concise, omitting both the mystical prologue and the incantation. Yet, as the tale evolves through the ages, reaching the Neo-Assyrian epic in Nineveh, the tradition of concluding with an incantation resurfaces, this time invoking the goddess Gula to ward off illness. At its heart, Adapa's tale remains consistent across variations, blending myth with ritual. However, in the mythic narrative, Adapa's mastery of words and wisdom doesn't solve mortal quandaries. Instead, it presents a celestial conundrum, challenging the gods themselves. The Sumerian version begins in the primordial age shrouded in mystery. In those distant days, after the flood had swept over and the destruction of the land had been brought about, the tale unfolds in a primordial epoch, a time of emerging consciousness and the dawn of civilization. It speaks of monumental inventions that shaped human history, the creation of canals, the birth of agriculture, and the establishment of kingship, specifically referencing the legendary first dynasty of Kish, possibly led by the mythical Etana. This era, while marked by a nascent burgeoning knowledge, was also a period of blissful naivete. The mighty South Wind, known only for its benign influences, blew across a world where the concepts of command and obedience were yet to be understood. After a gap in the narrative, we meet Adapa, a fervent follower. Adapa's daily routine involves fishing to provide for Enki's temple in the ancient city of Eridu. His seafaring is a precarious art, managing without the aid of a rudder or pole, yet his skill is unmatched. However, one day his boat is capsized by the tumultuous south wind. In a fit of rage, Adapa breaks the wings of the wind, causing a disturbance that reaches the high heavens and the ears of the supreme deity, Anu. Anu Anu's decree is for Adapa to ascend to heaven. Before his journey, Enki counsels Adapa with cryptic advice about the offerings he will encounter in heaven. Bread, water, a garment, and oil. Enki instructs him to refuse the first three, but to accept the oil. Additionally, Adapa is to don mourning attire, and upon meeting the deities, Dumuzi and Nigishzida, he is to explain that their demise is the reason for his earthly presence. This act of respect is meant to grant him favor and entry into the divine realm. Adapa's arrival in heaven coincides with a moment of ritual significance. On the day of ritual bathing, the day of the new moon, the day of judgment, in heaven, Adapa is received with honors befitting a deity, even offered a throne, a symbol of his potential elevation to immortality. Yet, as forewarned by Enki, he declines the gifts of bread, water, and a garment, each a metaphorical key to eternal life. And the high god, upon witnessing Adapa's refusal, reveals a bitter truth with a laugh. Enki, in his cunning wisdom, has orchestrated this very scenario to prevent Adapa from attaining immortality. The narrative reaches its climax with two pivotal events. First, Adapa is charged with the task of mending the south wind's wings, a symbolic act of reconciliation and restoration of order. Following this, and decrees a momentous shift in the cosmos. The instructions, Aga, rituals, Bidluda, and principles of order, Me are to descend from the heavens, granting humanity access to divine knowledge for the first time. This celestial download marks a new era where humans can harness and ritualize the powers that once solely belonged to the gods. The story concludes with an incantation, possibly the first of its kind, a magical utterance against the south wind. This spell, derived from Enki's own power, symbolizes the newfound ability of humans to interact with and influence the divine realm. In this moment, Adapa's tale transforms from a narrative of personal trial to a foundation myth explaining the origins of human wisdom, rituals, and the very fabric of ordered society.
Through Adapa's journey, the story illustrates the transition from a world governed by the whims of gods to one where humans hold the knowledge to shape their own destinies. The ancient text of Adapa and the South Wind presents three distinct elements that diverge from its later adaptations, spanning from the late Bronze Age Akkadian versions to Hellenistic Greek interpretations by Barassos. These variations not only highlight the evolving narrative of Adapa, but also align with the broader tradition surrounding this mythic figure. Etiology of Adapa's Power The original tale serves as a detailed etiology, explaining the origins of Adapa's unique yet transmissible abilities over demons and healing. The story vividly illustrates a paradox where Adapa initially disables a demonic wind and is subsequently divinely chosen to heal it. This act symbolizes his dominance over formidable supernatural forces. Later versions transform this theme, often diluting the explicit nature of Adapa's dual role as both conqueror and healer of the demonic. Adapa's Heavenly Throne In the earliest accounts, Adapa is granted a throne in heaven, signifying a potential elevation to divinity or immortality. This significant event fades from later narratives, though echoes of it resurface in the first millennium Babylonian shrine where the son of Uan, Adapa, is mentioned as sitting on the throne of An. The disappearance and subtle re-emergence of this motif in later texts indicate a shifting perspective on Adapa's status and his relationship with the divine. Cultural heroism and order Initially, Adapa is portrayed as a pivotal figure in introducing culture and order to humanity. His heavenly initiation triggers the descent of cosmic principles, guiding human civilization's development. This aspect is creatively reinterpreted by Barossos, who recasts Adapa as a Hellenistic culture hero, a protos heretis, or first inventor. This reimagining reflects a broader trend in ancient narratives to align older myths with contemporary cultural and intellectual ideals. These divergences highlight the fluid nature of mythmaking, where stories adapt to fit new contexts and audiences, altering characters and events to resonate with the prevailing cultural ethos. Oedipus Tale, with its variations, serves as a fascinating example of how myths evolve, reflecting the changing values, beliefs, and knowledge of the societies that retell them. The scholarship surrounding the Akkadian narratives of Adapa delves into the inherent paradoxes presented in the texts. The question of whether Adapa's visit to heaven was a triumph or a failure, and whether he ultimately benefited or harmed humanity. These narratives offer ambiguous elements that Assyriologists have interpreted in various, often contrasting, ways. One significant piece of evidence comes from a proverb from the early second millennium, which portrays Adapa as a figure who knows no loss as he traverses the mountains, Kur, a term also denoting the cosmic underworld or otherworld. This depiction aligns Adapa with the archetype of a wise and capable explorer of both the physical and metaphysical realms. The incident where Adapa encounters a supernatural disaster on the waters near Eridu, Asogidid with the Abzu, the cosmic home of Enki, further cements his role in navigating and interacting with this otherworldly spaces. This duality of being weiss and entangled in cosmic conflicts is central to the nature and power of the Apkalu, of which Adapa is a prime example. Adapa's most enduring qualities, as highlighted in Israel's study, language has power of life and death are his absolute power over words and his role as the servant of Enki, the god of wisdom, magic, and mischief. These attributes mark him as a patron figure for scribes and ritual practitioners. However, despite these insights, the literary analysis of Adapa's story remains inherently inconclusive due to its fundamentally ambiguous nature, a characteristic that is quintessential to understanding Adapa himself. To gain a more comprehensive understanding of Adapa's significance. Scholars propose examining how Mesopotamian scribes and their culture historically interpreted and utilized the figure of Adapa. By exploring these native interpretations and the various contexts in which Mesopotamian scholars applied the myth of Adapa, one can uncover how his meaning and relevance evolved over time within the culture. This approach goes beyond literary analysis, seeking to understand the broader cultural and historical implications 
of Adapa's story and how it influenced and reflected the beliefs, values, and knowledge of the Mesopotamian civilization. First Millennium Kings and Adapa. First millennium Mesopotamian kings often sought to align themselves with figures of mythic wisdom and power to legitimize and exalt their rule, and Adapa emerged as a particularly resonant symbol for these rulers. Sargon II, notable for his conquest of Israel, is the earliest known ruler to invoke Adapa, choosing him over other mythic heroes like Gilgamesh or Atrahasis. In an inscription from his town, Dur Sharukan, Fort Sargon, he is likened to Adapa in terms of open-mindedness, perceptiveness, and wisdom. Attribute attributes essential for a ruler of his stature and ambition. This comparison wasn't merely a personal boast, but a political and intellectual strategy. By aligning himself with Adapa, a sage known for his wisdom and power over the supernatural, Sargon the Sen and subsequent kings like Sennacherib and Esarhaddon were not just claiming a metaphorical kinship with these revered figures, but were also asserting their divine mandate and exceptional intellectual and moral qualities. The term rival equal, Shinat, used in these references suggests that these kings saw themselves not just as ordinary rulers, but as possessing a wisdom and capability on par with the legendary sages, a significant claim in a culture that highly valued such knowledge and power. This association also had practical implications. It wasn't just about personal or divine wisdom, but was tied to the very real and tangible achievements of these rulers, particularly in their building programs and military conquests. For instance, Sennacherib's annals don't just praise his wisdom, they link it directly to the success of his construction projects and conquests, suggesting that his capabilities are evidence of his divine endowment and his rightful place as a ruler. Similarly, Esarhaddon's claim of being. Rival of the sage Adapa. While discussing his plans for rebuilding an arsenal further solidifies this trend. These kings weren't just comparing themselves to Adapa. They were positioning themselves within a tradition of divinely sanctioned wisdom and power, asserting their rule as a continuation of the cosmic order and cultural heritage that Adapa represented. This strategic invocation of Adapa reflects a sophisticated understanding of the power of myth and symbolism in upholding and justifying the authority of kings in ancient Mesopotamian society. The evolving narrative of Assyrian kings aligning themselves with Adapa reflects a broader shift in the royal ideology of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, particularly under the Sargonid dynasty. The Sargonids didn't just perform more rituals and collect more texts, they also expanded the range of textual genres incorporated into their royal inscriptions. This practice wasn't merely about showcasing the diversity of their empire's knowledge, but was a deliberate move to position the royal texts themselves as symbols of Assyrian knowledge and power. The king's deeds were increasingly presented not just as military or administrative achievements, but as scholarly and cognitive feats. This shift is evident in the way kings like Assurbanipal, who reigned from 669-630 BCE, spoke of their accomplishments. Assurbanipal's building inscription is particularly telling. While it does describe his building program, the focus is on his comprehensive scholarly knowledge. His claim of grasping the work of the sage Adapa, the hidden treasure of the whole scribal art, suggests a deeper connection with Adapa's wisdom, possibly even attributing the invention of cuneiform writing to him. This statement isn't just about venerating an ancient sage, it's about claiming a direct lineage and mastery over the same profound and hidden knowledge that Adapa was said to possess. For Assurbanipal, this scholarly prowess wasn't just a personal trait, but a central aspect of his rule. He didn't just claim to be in the temples or part of the Council of Scholars. He also professed the ability to interpret dreams and tablets, skills that would have been highly valued in Assyrian society for their connection to divine wisdom and guidance. 
This isn't just the king presenting himself as a warrior or a builder, but as a scholar, a wise man, and a priestly figure with access to cosmic secrets and divine favor. These narratives reflect a sophisticated understanding of kingship, where power isn't just derived from military might or divine right, but also from wisdom, learning, and a connection to the cultural and intellectual heritage of the empire. By aligning themselves with Adapa and emphasizing their scholarly achievements, these kings were not just constructing a persona for themselves. They were crafting an image of the Assyrian Empire as a realm of knowledge, wisdom, and cosmic order, with the king as both its guardian and its greatest exemplar. Asurbanipal's reign marked a significant transformation in Assyrian scribal culture, characterized by the state-sponsored expansion and modification of intellectual traditions. This period saw a surge in the production of commentaries and ritual texts, indicating a broader intellectual movement rather than mere preservation of existing knowledge. The emergence of entirely new discursive forms, notably the cultic commentary, exemplifies this shift. These texts were not just additions to the scholarly corpus, but were notably complex and challenging, suggesting they were intended for a select, informed audience. The complexity of these materials likely stems from their in-group nature, designed for a scholarly community deeply immersed in the nuances of their craft. The process described as intextualization, where oral traditions and discourses are transformed into fixed, written texts, played a significant role here. Linguistic anthropologists observe that this shift from fluid oral tradition to fixed written form often involves a level of abstraction and formalization that can make the resulting texts obscure to those not initiated into their specific context and use. This move towards creating complex, explanatory texts that are difficult for the uninitiated to understand wasn't just an academic exercise. It represented an extension of Neo-Assyrian centralizing power into the realm of writing and intellectual life. By fostering a state-sponsored scholarly culture and creating texts that required specialized knowledge to understand, the Assyrian state was not just preserving knowledge, but actively shaping it. This effort was likely aimed at furthering the centralization and standardization of knowledge, aligning intellectual culture with the state's political and cultural objectives. The appearance of these difficult, context-dependent texts in royal libraries is more than a mere historical curiosity. It's indicative of a broader strategy to control and direct the intellectual life of the empire. These texts served as a record of the state's engagement with an authority over scholarly activity, demonstrating a deliberate policy of cultivating, controlling, and utilizing intellectual culture to reinforce the power and prestige of the Assyrian state and its ruler. This period represents a pivotal moment in the history of Assyrian intellectual culture, where the state actively intervened to shape, standardize, and control the production and dissemination of knowledge. Asurbanipal's claim to have grasped all knowledge is akin to a scholarly superhero's boast, presenting himself as an ancient sage with extraordinary powers. This image is not just for show, but serves as political theater, positioning him as a rival to celestial beings, privy to the universe's secrets, and a decoder of mystical messages among the intellectual elite. He's like a character from a cosmic drama, claiming a lineage from wise ancestors and divine beings beings, much like a royal claiming descent from gods. In contrast, Nebuchadnezzar the Fur, another ruler, paints himself with a humbler brush, tracing his roots back to a Sumerian king famed for divination, but doesn't claim such powers himself. Instead, he projects this mystical ability back into a storied past, creating a grandiose family tree. Asurbanipal's scholars run with this theme, suggesting he descends from a sage and the mythical Adapa, further blending politics with the prestige of the scholarly world. As empires fell and rose in Mesopotamia, the character Adapa morphed from a wise man into a symbol of the changing relationship between knowledge and power. Babylonian scholarship, with its rich intellectual tradition, continued and even blossomed in some areas like mathematical astronomy. Yet, 
its tie to the ruling regime evolved significantly. By the time the Persians ruled, the dynamics had flipped entirely. Kings like Cyrus used the scholarly narrative to undermine their predecessors, employing the same sophisticated language to craft satirical tales. One such parody ridicules Nabonidus circa 540-530 BCE, previous ruler, by depicting him as a bumbling artist who made a hideous statue of the moon god, turning the profound relationship between wisdom and royal authority into a farcical anecdote. Air Mumu did not shape its form the wise, or you and Adipa did not know its name. The criticism aimed at Nabonidus suggests that his religious reforms were so outlandish they shocked even the gods and sages, those believed to have conceived the cosmos. Central to this is Ea, a deity envisioned as crafting every creature and concept within the Apsu, a primordial, watery abyss representing the source of all wisdom and forms. Adipa, a mythic figure, is renowned as the one who knows the names of all Ea's creation, reflecting the ancient belief that knowing something's name grants power over it. This portrayal of Adapa as the ultimate scholar and exorcist is critical. In Mesopotamian education, much learning revolved around understanding signs and names, with the idea that naming an ailment is a step toward curing it. Adapa's role is somewhat akin to Adam in Genesis, who names animals, or God in Psalm 147, who names the stars. Yet, it's perhaps most closely mirrored by Enoch in the Aramaic texts, who, in a divine revelation, learns the names of all the stars. As the narrative continues, Cyrus inserts a tirade into Nabonidus's mouth, using this ancient tradition of naming and knowledge as a backdrop to criticize and mock his predecessor's religious practices, highlighting the intertwining of knowledge, power, and religion in the ancient world. Nabonidus is depicted as declaring he surpasses Adapa in knowledge, referencing a piece titled The Lunar Crescent of Anu and En. Lil. This statement is laced with a Sumerian pun that is lost in translation, but intended to portray Nabonidus as both mad and conceited. The irony is thick. He's trying to align himself with the esteemed astronomical divinatory text, Anuma Anu Enlil, yet he bungles it. His obsession with the moon god leads him to misrepresent the text's name, inadvertently substituting it with a deity's name. This portrayal is biting criticism, implying that Nabonidus's religious fervor has made him foolish, so much so that he confuses a foundational scholarly work with his personal deity. It's a clever play on words that paints him as profoundly out of touch, unable to grasp even the basics that every learned person would know, and suggests his innovations in religion stem from ignorance and delusion rather than enlightenment. This scathing parody marks a seismic shift in Mesopotamian history and culture, becoming possible only after the demise of local rulers. The satire turns the Neo-Assyrian tradition on its head. Previously, kings like Assurbanipal would compare themselves to Adapa to elevate their status, but now Nabonidus's self-comparison is mocked, his ambition seen as overreaching hubris. This inversion of roles highlights the changed landscape where the once revered association of a king with an Apkalu, a wise sage, is now seen as almost sacrilegious. This new portrayal of Adapa signifies a broader historical transformation. Mesopotamian scholarship, once a tool in the hands of the king to legitimize his rule, has slipped from the monarchy's grasp. Cyrus's verse account reflects this shift, part of a wider evolution in Mesopotamian literary genres. While the Akkadian tradition of royal inscriptions continues, the context dramatically changes with foreign rulers now at the helm, altering the dynamic between royal authority and indigenous traditions. While Persian kings did adopt certain Mesopotamian cultural and rhetorical elements, they selectively chose what suited them. A Persian king never again claims the detraditional Mesopotamian knowledge, or portrays himself as a sage of cuneiform wisdom. The era of kings boasting divine wisdom and sage-like prowess ended not with a whisper, but with a scornful jest at the expense of a native king, marking a definitive end to a long 
long-standing tradition. When Mesopotamian scholarship continued without a native king, it underwent a significant transformation. The scholars and scribes who had long been pivotal in maintaining and administering Mesopotamian cultural and religious traditions found themselves in a new role. Without a Mesopotamian monarch to serve, these learned groups maintained their prominence, but their relationship with power and tradition evolved. They began to take more direct control of the public manifestations of their knowledge, collaborating with the new foreign rulers. Textual traditions, once a means to link the present with the divine and the ancestral past, continued to serve this purpose. But the scribes were now the primary custodians of this continuity. They became the sole bearers of an ancient legacy preserving and perpetuating the wisdom of the past in a world where the political landscape had dramatically shifted. This transition is evident in the cuneiform texts from the Persian and Hellenistic periods. These texts, produced under new rulers and different cultural influences, reflect the changing role of scholars and the enduring importance of their work. A poignant example of this continuity amidst change is the brick of Anu'ubalat Kefalon, a figure with a hybrid Babylonian Greek name, indicative of the cultural transformations during the Seleucid period. As a city magistrate in Uruk under Antiochus IV, his brick in the new Seleucid era shrine, the Resh Shrine which Oannes Adapa built of old, as shows the enduring legacy of Mesopotamian tradition. Even as the political and cultural context transformed, the scholars continued to assert their ancient heritage, linking the present with the mythical past and showcasing the resilience and adaptability of Mesopotamian scholarship. The dedication on the massive new Anu temple in Uruk represents a remarkable shift in Mesopotamian tradition. Historically, building inscriptions were the domain of King and governors, symbols of their power, piety, and connection to a venerable past. They often boasted of reconstructing ancient works, linking themselves to revered royal ancestors. However, this unique inscription attributes the construction of a temple to a mythical sage, Adapa, rather than a reigning monarch. This unprecedented move highlights the evolving memory and status of kings and sages during the Seleucid period. The concept of a sage as a builder had myth precedents. Gilgamesh, for example, likened the impeccable foundations of Uruk to the work of the seven counselors. Yet, the explicit credit given to Adapa for building the Resh temple, the grandest shrine to the sky god Anu, is unparalleled. This shift is significant, indicating that the traditional royal prerogative of founding temples had been symbolically transferred to a figure of wisdom and knowledge. Adapa's prominence in the Resh temple's rituals during the Hellenistic period period further underscores this transformation. He wasn't just a mythical figure from the past, he was actively incorporated into contemporary religious practices, participating in the procession of gods during significant ceremonies. His role extended beyond the Resh temple. He was also significant in the Asagila temple at Babylon, dedicated to the same sky god Anu. The inclusion of Adapa in these contexts, especially in the Uruk temple's archives as the sage associated with the first king in history marks a historical departure. A mythical sage now usurped what was traditionally a royal privilege, reflecting a broader shift in how knowledge, power, and tradition were conceptualized. In a time of changing rulers and cultures, the elevation of a sage over a king in such a public and permanent manner speaks to the enduring influence and reimagined role of Mesopotamian scholarship in maintaining and reshaping the region's cultural and religious identity. The Seleucid period in Uruk presents a fascinating tapestry of cultural intermingling, where Hellenistic, Babylonian, and Aramaic influences converged. This blend is vividly embodied by the author of the Anu Temple inscription, who also crafted Aramaic glazed brick inscriptions for the Irigal, another principal temple in Uruk. This individual's work represents a microcosm of the broader cultural synthesis of the era. In this time, rulers and prominent figures, though perhaps
perhaps of Greek origin or influence, deeply embedded themselves within the Mesopotamian societal and economic fabric. They adopted Mesopotamian customs and contributed to the local architecture and religious life. Their Greek Akkadian names, a hybrid identity marker, were inscribed on the very temples that stood as symbols of Mesopotamian spiritual and cultural heritage. However, these inscriptions were an Aramaic script reflecting the linguistic and cultural diversity of the period. The use of glazed bricks for these inscriptions harks back to a long Mesopotamian tradition known for its vibrant and durable architectural decorations. By inscribing their names in this enduring medium, these rulers and officials were not just asserting their presence, but were also weaving themselves into the long-standing historical and cultural narrative of the region. This period was marked by a dynamic exchange and fusion of ideas, practices, and identities. The temples of Uruk, with their multilingual and multicultural inscriptions, stand as testament to a time when ancient Mesopotamian traditions were reinterpreted and reinvigorated through the lens of Hellenistic and Aramaic influences, creating a unique and enduring cultural legacy. Adapa in Catalogues and Letters Adapa's elevation in Mesopotamian lore as a scribal hero and author significantly impacted perceptions of authorship and knowledge transmission. He is featured in several catalogs, hinting at his revered status and perhaps even crediting him as the author of significant astronomical divinatory texts. This reverence is not just a nod to his mythical wisdom, but also to his role as a transmitter and creator of knowledge. The depiction of Adapa as both a scribe and an author reflects the deep respect for the written word and its creators in Mesopotamian culture. His popularity in the first millennium Mesopotamian scribal tradition further underscores this. Adapa wasn't just a mythical figure. He was a symbol, an emblematic character representing the pinnacle of scholarly achievement. The texts attributed to him, whether genuinely his or ascribed to him to lend authority, show the high regard in which scribes and scholars were held. The references to Adapa in various texts and contexts indicate a complex layering of tradition, reverence, and scholarly practice. He is at once a mythical figure, a sage, an author, and a symbol of the profound connection between the divine, the cosmos, and the written word. This multifaceted portrayal enriches our understanding of Mesopotamian culture and its deep-seated veneration for knowledge and those who wielded it. Which Adapa wrote at his dictation. At last, we've unearthed a mere sliver of an ancient library catalog from the Seleucid era, name-dropping Adapa as a notable author. Intriguingly, this find was made in the very temple Adapa was rumored to have been built in Uruk, known as the Resh. In this locale, Adapa was celebrated during the New Year's festivities in honor of Ishtar. Neo-Assyrian royal correspondences echo this sentiment, portraying Adapa as the embodiment of kingly wisdom. For instance, one scholarly letter exclaims, The king's deeds mirror those of Adapa. However, the most telling piece of correspondence to Assurbanipal unveils a fascinating aspect of this intellectual monarch's self-perception. He viewed himself not merely as a ruler, but as a paragon of Mesopotamian learning, akin to the legendary Apkalu. Adapa's influence seemingly infiltrated the personal and professional lives of Assyrian rulers. The kingdom's chief exorcist assured Esarhaddon, the king's mother rivals Adapa in capability that meanwhile, astrologers and other courtiers flattered the king by comparing his wisdom to that of Adapa. In a particularly imaginative twist, a letter from Marduk, Shumu Usur, to Asurbanipal dreams of a celestial endorsement, proclaiming the king as a descendant of both a sage and Adapa himself, surpassing the wisdom of the abyss and all scholarship. This isn't just flattery, it's a testament to a broader royal narrative. Here, the king is not just a political figure but a scholarly giant standing on the shoulders of his revered ancestor, Sennacherib, and aspiring to the intellectual heights of Adapa. As history would have it, the fate of Babylon and its ancient wisdom soon rested in the hands of such scholarly kings. 
Adapa wasn't just a figure of royal admiration. He was a core symbol for ancient sages, outliving even the great Asurbanipal by nearly a thousand years. His legacy was deeply woven into the very identity of these learned men. The Utuku Lemnutu series, a set of Sumerian Akkadian exorcistic incantations, serves as a testament to this enduring reverence. Originating from the old Babylonian Udug Hul texts, these incantations prominently featured Adapa and remained in use up until the first century BCE. This collection wasn't just a set of rituals, it was a symbolic embodiment of Adapa's wisdom and Role. By invoking his name, the Ashipu, or human ritual experts, weren't just performing rites. They were stepping into his shoes, channeling his profound knowledge and mastery over the supernatural. In this way, Adapa's legacy was more than just a story or a name. It was an enduring, living tradition that continued to inspire and guide these ancient practitioners of the mystical arts. The Earth Lords, the Earth Ladies, the Enkums, the Ninkums, as Adapa, Sage of Eridu, I am indeed the exorcist of Enki. I am indeed the messenger messenger of Asaluhi, the great Lord Enki, has sent me to revive the sick man. Adapa was more than a mythical figure. He was a vital ally for ancient exorcists. They called upon him for protection, particularly against Lamashtu, a demon known for abducting children. In their rituals, these healers would command Lamashtu to the distant sea, a place where her malevolent power would diminish, thereby safeguarding the community. This practice underscored Adapa's enduring influence and the practical application of his wisdom in combating darkness and disease. I will make you ride the four winds. I will fill your boat with travel provisions, will send you just you off, the clever one, alternate text, the one who casts spells on you. Adapa, sage of Eridu, is the one who looks at you. In Eridu, he will scrutinize you, just you. He will neutralize your venom. He will keep your hands off from the body of this infant under the protection of his god. Be off, go away. Adapa, with his sharp eye and undeniable charm, stands firm against the demoness drawing strength from a mystical underground spring bubbling with magic and ancient secrets. Her tricks have met their match. Yet, Lamashtu, her powers so vast, can only be advised by Adapa to seek her fortunes elsewhere. Such is the scale of adversaries he faces. In his role as a maestro of words, both a ceremonial wizard and a scribe, Adapa weaves his prowess into two spells disguised as letters. The first, a cleverly crafted message, is addressed to a mysterious character whose very name whispers of ancient times. To Libor Zanini, Spii, thus says Adapa, the sage, let us go traverse the entire land, draw hallelu water from a well, throw it on Pien, son of Pien. Take the hand of the sick man, cast the incantation of Ia on him, so that the man will get better. A second letter, supposedly written by Adapa, is directed to the legendary first king of Mesopotamia, Alulu, and it offers magical medical advice. Say to Alulu, thus Adapa the sage, thus to Alulu not only reinforces Adapa's wisdom, but intriguingly positions him at the dawn of Mesopotamian mythological history. Alulu isn't just any king. He's the inaugural ruler of Mesopotamia and monarch of Eridu, Adapa's mythological stomping ground, and the domain of Enki, the god connected to Adapa. The most detailed account of Adapa, including a sort of biography of him and his sage companions, is found in the ritual called Bo'a Meseri, or the Sealed House. This ritual, central to discussions about Adapa's mythological journey to the heavens, hasn't been fully translated into English. Yet Dr. Seth L. Sanders translated the first incantation of Tablet 3 from this significant Sumerian Akkadian ritual text, offering a glimpse into this ancient narrative. Incantation. Uana, who completes the plan of heaven and earth. Uana Duga, endowed with broad mind. Emaduga, ordained with a happy fate. Enmegalama, formed in a house. Enmebuluga, who grew in a field. Anenlilda, incantation priest of Eridu. Utuabzu, who ascended to heaven. 
They are the seven brilliant Puradu fish, Puradu fish of the sea, seven Apkalu formed in the river who keep the plans of heaven and earth in order, Nungalpirigal, Apkalu of Enmerka, who brought Ishtar down from heaven into the Eanna, Pirigal Nungal, formed in Kish, who angered Adad in heaven so that he did not let there be rain or vegetation in the land for three years. Pirigalabzu, formed in Adab, who hung his seal on a seal fish, and thus angered Enki in the Abzu, so that a fuller struck him with his own seal. Fourth, Lunana, two-thirds Apkalu, who drove a dragon out of the Eninkiag, Nunna, the Ista temple of Shulgi, four Apkalu of human descent who Lord Enki endowed with broad understanding, ritual action. Before the seven Puradu Apkalu, who are striped with plaster and black paste, which are drawn on the wall of the side of the sanctuary, you recite the above. This ancient text is fascinating because it seems crafted to invoke a team of supernatural sages, detailing their characteristics and recounting their tales. Known from the Neo-Assyrian era and still in use during the Seleucid period, this text differs from other, more direct incantations with its narrative style. Rather than issuing commands, it aims to make the sages, known as Apkalu, present by recounting their histories and attributes. This isn't about performing a magical medical act on the spot. It's about setting the stage for one, preparing the ground by reciting these histories before images of the Apkalu to tap into their power for the ritual's next steps. This incantation is particularly particularly insightful as it's the sole text merging stories of various sages offering a peek into scholarly traditions of the first millennium. However, it's not a straightforward guide. It attaches astonishing tales to names somewhat haphazardly, with the real thread being the sage's disruptive force. The text mentions seven fish-like Apkalu and four humanoid ones, the latter with more developed stories. Yet, in the broader ritual context, only the fish Apkalu are visually represented, highlighting a selective use of sage traditions. These narratives of conflict with gods and world altering events mirror those of Adapa, another sage with tumultuous tales. The real magic, it seems, lies not in the physical representations, but in the mere act of recounting these sages' stories, invoking the raw, disruptive power of their words and deeds. The roles and tales of the sages in Mesopotamian texts are notably fluid, with variations and overlaps within and across narratives. The text opens with a nod to Uwana, who is also known as U-Anadapa, positioning Adapa as a premier sage among the Apkalu. However, it attributes the heavenly ascent not to Adapa, but to the seventh sage, Utuabzu. This divergence is just one example of the fluidity, while Adapa is linked with Enmerkar. In one myth, another sage, Nungal Pirigal is given that association here. Remarkably, who completes the plan of heaven and earth, attributed to Adapa, is also applied collectively to all seven non-human sages in subsequent lines. Additionally, while typically only Adapa is said to have ascended to heaven among the Apkalu, Utuabzu is also described as making this celestial journey and even as descending from heaven in another fragmentary part of the text, suggesting a possible division of Adapa's mythic journey. Understanding this attribute, multiplication, and narrative flow fluidity is challenging. Scholars have often sought a single canonical Mesopotamian ascent narrative, usually focusing on a heroic figure, the seventh in a sequence, linked with names like Adapa, Utuabzu, and in Medaranki. However, this approach likely oversimplifies the rich, varied, and evolving tapestry of Mesopotamian scribal culture. The multiple strands and historical shifts within this tradition suggest that looking for a single, unchanging story might be a misunderstanding of how these myths functioned and developed over time. Instead, the overlapping roles and shared attributes among different sages reflect a dynamic storytelling tradition where themes and characteristics are fluid, shared, and repurposed across different figures and tales. The notion of placing a hero in the seventh position is a common narrative and structuring motif seen in both Mesopotamian and Judahite genealogies. This pattern is not just a storytelling technique, but also serves as an organizational principle, reflecting a broader, cultural, 
and mythological significance to the number seven. Dr. Borger's 1974 analysis highlights Utuabzu's association with the seventh king Enmeduranki in a Seleucid era Uruk list of kings and sages, proposing Utuabzu as the archetypal sage who ascended to heaven, suggesting a parallel with the biblical Enoch. However, this connection, based on a single document, doesn't necessarily reflect a widespread tradition. Mesopotamian texts frequently recombine and rearrange figures and attributes, demonstrating the fluidity and adaptability of these narratives. For instance, while Adapa is linked with Enmerkar in one myth, he's associated with the first king, Alulu, in another, and Nungalparigal, typically matched with Enmerkar, appears in a different position in other lists. This pattern of recombination is evident in other traditions as well, such as the Sumerian king list, where Itana, another hero who ascended to heaven, is also placed as the seventh king in a post-Diluvian dynasty. This fluidity underscores the importance of understanding Mesopotamian scribal culture as a whole, rather than seeking a single, unchanging narrative. The recurrent motif of a seventh figure having a special divine encounter or revelation is a theme rather than a strict rule, applied with variations across different texts and traditions. While scholars like Vanderkam and Borger aren't entirely wrong in drawing parallels between Mesopotamian figuries and Enoch, the reality is more complex. No single figure embodies the seventh seiji archetypy exclusively. Instead, the pattern reflects the broader narrative and symbolic practices of Mesopotamian scribal culture. The focus should be on the overarching role these figures play within this culture, which often involves transgression or special interaction with the divine, as seen in various texts, including a Neo-Assyrian prayer to Marduk, where Adapa's role might further demonstrate this theme. The one whom he, in his fury, he honors Marduk. Have mercy on your servant, the sage, lit Adapa, who take away, Lord, his guilt, remove his punishment. His mouth has confessed the sin he committed. References to Adapa frequently highlight his wisdom and authority in various texts, with his name literally equating to wise. Beyond wisdom, Adapa also embodies hubris, notably in narratives where he appears as a transgressor who faces divine consequences, such as in the Beat Messery texts. Here, figures like Pirigal Nungal and Pirigal Abzu provoke God leading to severe repercussions, illustrating the Apkalu's dual role as intermediaries between divine and human realms. In a particular Neo-Assyrian prayer to Marduk, the speaker possibly aligns with Adapa's transgressor aspect, suggesting a complex relationship with the gods. Through both their wisdom and follies, figures like Adapa symbolize the intricate dynamics between heaven and earth in Mesopotamian mythology. Adapa, in scholarly lists, scribal accounts of history, geography, and the divine realm dive into the world of ancient scribes with the Esagila Chronicle, where Adapa, a figure shrouded in myth, steps out of his usual roles to deliver justice. This isn't just any tale. It's a groundbreaking mix of historical chronicle, personal reflection, and sage advice. Picture it as an ancient letter from one ruler to another, unfolding the history of Mesopotamia with a focus on the worship of the god Marduk in the vibrant city of Babylon. The story's core message is clear and ominous. Offend the city's deities, and your reign as king will swiftly end. Central to this narrative is a simple yet profound ritual. Clean the temple of Marduk and supply fish, and you'll secure your throne. Adapa, not just a mythic figure, but also a model priest, embodies this ritual by providing for his god's temple. What's fascinating is the connection between Adapa's priestly duties and the royal rituals of later times. This isn't just about religious rites. It's about the power of piety and devotion in shaping leadership. The tale takes a surprising turn when it's Adapa, the epitome of wisdom and duty, who punishes the negligent king in Merkar, not a god. This marks a significant shift in how power and responsibility were perceived. The story of Adapa is more than an ancient legend. It's a reflection on the evolution of leadership, where the qualities of a wise priest become the standard for kings.
Egyptians, the authority once thought to belong to the gods shifts into the hands of those wise enough to wield it. The ancient city of Babylon was a hub of religious activity with its temples and shrines forming the bedrock of cultural and spiritual life. Central to this was a text known as Tintir, essentially a directory of these sacred spaces within the Grand Esagila Temple. This document, which became a foundational part of scribal education for over a millennium, lists numerous shrines, including one particularly intriguing entry. The Kitil Munna, designated as the place of the noble, where the son of Oans, associated with Adapa, is said to sit in the esteemed seat of Anu, the god of heaven. With its origins likely in the 12th century BCE and its relevance extending through the Persian period, Tintir was not just a guide. It was a a vital tool providing scholars with a mental map of Babylon's divine landscape. Despite the potential changes over centuries, its description of the city's spiritual geography remained a key educational text. Interestingly, while there are other accounts of Adapa from this era, Tintir stands out because it's the most widespread and actively used text that mentions him. In this most prominent of documents, Adapa, or perhaps his descendant, is depicted in a position of extraordinary honor, enthroned beside the king of the gods. This portrayal contrasts with other, less widely circulated narratives from the period, highlighting Adapa's significance not just in myth, but in the very real and revered spaces of Babylon. Moreover, the form Uenum, used to refer to Adapa or his progeny in Tintir, echoes the name found in later accounts by historians like Barossos, suggesting a continuity and evolution of his story over time. Here, Adapa is more than a mythic figure. He's a cultural hero akin to Enoch, credited with imparting crucial knowledge like writing and mathematics to humanity. Tintir's depiction of Adapa places him at the heart of Babylon's religious and cultural identity, reflecting his enduring importance and the evolving understanding of his role over centuries. This text doesn't just map out physical spaces, it charts a significant part of the spiritual and intellectual terrain of ancient Mesopotamian civilization. The Uruk Apkalu list is a groundbreaking cuneiform document that places scholars alongside kings in the story of Mesopotamian history, recognizing their significant contributions to the civilization's legacy. In the time of King Ayalu, one was sage, Apkalu. In the time of King Alalgar, Wanduga was sage. In the time of King Ameluana, Enmeduga was sage. In the time of King Amegalana, Enmegalama was sage. In the time of King Enam Yushumgalana, and Mabuluga was sage. In the time of King Dumuzi the shepherd, Anenlilda was sage. In the time of King Enmeduranki, Utuabzu was sage. This document was discovered in the historical archives of the Resh Temple, believed to have been constructed by the legendary figure Adapa in the ancient city of Uruk during the Seleucid era. Precisely, it dates back to the 147th year of King Antiochus' vice reign, around 133 BCE. The discovery was made along seed various ritual texts pertaining to the Resh temple, revealing connections to Adapa. Notably, it links Adapa with the mythical figure Ayalu, likely another name for Alalu, revered as the inaugural ruler of Adapa's hometown, Eridu, as per the ancient Sumerian king list. This association is critical because it intertwines Adapa's story with that of Alalu, who, in some narratives, is replaced by Etana, another ascendant to the heavens. This document is significant as it merges two major cultural narratives. The list of seven Apkalu, sage-like figures, from one source, and the first seven kings from the Sumerian king list. This blending showcases an attempt to integrate specific ritual knowledge into the broader historical narrative. Moreover, it reflects a wider cultural practice of recording and honoring past wisdom and rulers. The most intriguing aspect of this discovery, however, is its connection to a vastly different type of literature by Barassos, a Hellenistic author. Barassos aimed to familiarize the Seleucid king Antiochus to a hundred nation with Babylonian culture through his work, the Babyloniaca. This text is a testament to the preservation and transmission of Babylonian traditions into the Hellenistic period. 
demonstrating remarkable consistency with the lists from the Uruk and Betmesseri texts. Regrettably, the original text of Barossos's work has not survived to the present day. Instead, what exists are fragmented adaptations in later Christian writings, which have been modified and reinterpreted several times to align with biblical narratives. This process of transmission and alteration significantly impacts the authenticity and reliability of the information, setting it apart from other ancient texts we've encountered. The remnants of Barassus's work are found primarily in medieval Armenian texts translated from Eusebius and Byzantine Greek manuscripts, notably by Synchelus. These sources, however, come with their own set of challenges. As noted by contemporary scholars such as de Bruker in 2010, the texts are heavily influenced not only by Christian viewpoints, but also by the Greek cultural lens through which Barassos initially presented his native Babylonian lore. This double layer of cultural reinterpretation, first Greek, then Christian, necessitates a cautious and discerning approach to their study. One of the more intriguing aspects of these accounts is their description of semi-divine beings, particularly those resembling the fish Apkalu, a type of sage associated with the legendary figure Adapa from the earlier discussion. These beings are depicted with fish-like characteristics, aligning with ancient Mesopotamian representations of wisdom and knowledge. Notably, such descriptions are found in the works of Alexander Polyhistor, who claims to base his accounts on Barassos's original text. In the very first year there appeared from the Red Sea in an area bordering on Babylonia, a frightening monster. It had the whole body of a fish, but underneath and attached to the head of the fish, there was another head, human, and joined to the tail of the fish, feet like those of a man and it had a human voice. Barroso says that this monster spent its days with men, never eating anything but teaching men the skills necessary for reet. Ing and for doing mathematics and for all sorts of knowledge, it taught men all those things conducive to a settled and civilized life. Since that time, nothing further has been discovered. At the end of the day, this monster Ornus went back to the sea and spent the night, Sincelus. 51 trans. Verbrugge and Rickersham, 1996, 44. The accounts differ about when he appeared, but one account correlates kings with semi-human sages. During the reign of Amenon the Chaldean, in this section listed as fourth, not first king, the monster Oannes, the Anadotos, appeared from the Red Sea. Alexander Polyhister claims he appeared in the first year, Berossos after 40 Saroi. And Abidenos says he was the second monster, who appeared after 26 Saroi. Despite the variations and redactions in the texts derived from Barassos's work, researchers have identified a remarkable consistency that points to his reliance on a Babylonian source closely related to the Uruk Apkalu list. This list, a register of seven mythological sages, or Apkalu, aligns significantly with one found in Barassos's narratives, notably beginning with Uan, Oans, and concluding with Utuabzu. This correlation was first recognized by Dr. Van Dyke in 1962, and has since been a pivotal point in understanding the intertextual connections between these ancient documents. However, a notable discrepancy arises concerning the final Apkalu, Utuabzu. In the versions preserved by Synchelus and Eusebius, this figure is replaced with names like Odakon and Anodophos, which show a closer resemblance to the second Apkalu, Uanduga, and potentially to Uan Adapa. This has led some scholars to speculate and perhaps wishfully interpret these names as variants of Utuabzu. Yet, as pointed out by Dr. Geller in 1997, when the rules for transliterating Sumerian and Akkadian into Greek are applied, these names align more convincingly with U and Adapa. This observation introduces an intriguing possibility. 
By the Seleucid period, the figure of U-Anadapa might have been divided into two distinct entities, U-An and U-Anadapa, with the latter being revered as the seventh sage and described in contemporary bit messery rituals as ascending to heaven. This potential splitting of identities adds a layer of complexity and depth to our understanding of how these ancient figures were transmitted and transformed over time and across cultures. Adapa in Myth Adapa's journey was more than a celestial exploration. It also involved a descent into the underworld alongside the notorious King and Merkar, whom he is said to have cursed in other tales. The saga of Adapa and Enmerkar opens with a mysterious figure, possibly Adapa, lamenting to the god Marduk. Despite the divine acknowledgement of this sorrow, there appears to be no assistance provided. Enmerkar, the ruler of Uruk, becomes entwined in this narrative, as he and Adapa venture beneath the earth and into a tomb, potentially engaging in forbidden rituals of communicating with the dead. An ancient corpse from remotest times. He made a terrible clamor in the palace. They went down nine cubits in the depths. Nine cubits of earth they went down. He, they destroyed the door of the tomb. Following the descent into the underworld, the narrative resumes with a grim scene. Enmakar and Adapa, having encountered something dreadful, urgently instruct a smith to reseal the tomb. Later, Adapa's anxiety is palpable as he seeks confirmation from the smith that the tomb's door remains firmly closed. This story significantly contributes to the evolving character of Adapa in two main ways. Firstly, it situates him in the mythic past as an associate or advisor to King and Merkar of Uruk, thus weaving him into the legendary tapestry of ancient times. Secondly, it presents a new variation of Adapa, and by extension, the Apkalu, a group of sage advisors, overstepping cosmic boundaries, disturbing the realms of heaven, hell, life, and death. Unlike his previous celestial disruptions, here, Adapa appears to unsettle the underworld, accompanied by a king also notorious for crossing divine boundaries. The exploration of Adapa's roles in Mesopotamian literature leads back to the intricate narrative of the Adapa and the South Wind myth, offering a chance to understand his depiction in the broader context of traditions involving the Apkalu, an ascension to heaven. This approach shifts the focus from the story's plot to its historical and cultural implications, including ritual practices, scholarly traditions, and the changing dynamics of the era. Adapa's portrayal as a ritual practitioner par excellence is central to the text. His role is so vital to the divine rituals that his absence would disrupt the very sustenance of the gods. This depiction might seem mundane, reflecting a predictable and dutiful servant. Yet it's his unwavering dedication to ritual and his profound connection to the gods Ea and Eridu that position him as a formidable figure. His ability to perform rituals flawlessly not only combats demons, but also poses a potential threat to the divine hierarchy itself. From ancient records, we understand that Adapa was a symbolic figure that exorcists in the old Babylonian period aspired to emulate. Dr. Falkenstein in 1931 identified declarations like as legitimization formulae. These statements not only claim the speaker's right to perform certain rituals, asserting their direct connection to Eridu, a hub of arcane knowledge and magic, but also associate them with Adapa, the archetypal ritualist. This association suggests that the speaker has the requisite skill to flawlessly complete an exorcism, a critical claim considering the Mesopotamians. Acute awareness of the potential for ritual failure and its grave consequences. In the realm of ritual performance, such statements emphasize the necessity of being a qualified individual and performing correctly. 
Adapa in this context is akin to the patron saint of Mesopotamian ritual, setting the standard for expertise and execution. Thus, the prerequisites for conducting these sacred acts become embedded within the texts themselves. However, the preservation of these declarations and ritual texts, rather than performance records, indicates they were more aspirational ideals than documented realities. This distinction points to a broader exploration of how ritual practitioners identified with and aspired to the wisdom and expertise of figures like Adapa. The narrative surrounding Adapa also significantly highlights his close relationship with the god Ea, a theme recurrent in rituals, myths, and even political propaganda. In the best-preserved Neo-Assyrian version of the story, there's a deliberate ambiguity in the text that blurs the distinction between Ea and Adapa, suggesting a deep connection or even a unity between them. This is evident where the text could imply that Ea Apkalu of Eridu was created by Adapa, though the context more likely suggests the reverse. Furthermore, the narrative equates Adapa's commands with those of Ea, a motif recurring in exorcism rituals where the words of the ritual performer are deemed as authoritative as those of a deity. This legitimization strategy is exemplified in the Marduk Ea type incantations, where the exorcist recites spells purportedly transmitted directly from Ea, symbolizing a unity between the speakers and the god's words. Similarly, the verse account of Nabonidus portrays Adapa as possessing complete knowledge of all creations by Ea Mumu, indicating a near cognitive identity between the sage and the deity. However, this close association with Ea isn't without its complexities. Texts like the Beat Messeri emphasize that the Apkalu, including Adapa, often engaged in acts of transgression and overreaching, such as the one of Kalu who supposedly brought the goddess Ishtar down from heaven. In Adapa's case, this theme of transgression extends to a tension between him and not just the god Anu, but also his own patron, Ea. This nuanced portrayal reflects a relationship of both deep connection and inherent conflict mirroring the complex dynamics between divine beings and their earthly counterparts in Mesopotamian mythology. I, according to my spell, call, O south wind, the other winds, your brothers. As strong as they may be nevertheless, I shall break your wing. As soon as he spoke, the south wind's wing broke. In the myth of Adapa, the protagonist's verbal prowess is not just a tool to confront adversaries, but holds the potential to subdue all winds, indicating a profound level of control and power. A critical yet previously unexplored aspect of Adapa's dilemma might stem from the intrinsic connection between the winds and the gods, particularly the South Wind's consistent identification with Ea, Adapa's patron deity. This wind embodies more than a mere natural force. It's a supernatural entity with a distinct personality deeply linked to Ea, the South Wind, pivotal to Mesopotamian agriculture, yet also listed among the chief demons, represents a dualistic force of both destruction and nourishment. Its association with Ea extends from ancient Sumerian texts to later Neo-Assyrian writings, where it's frequently referred to as beloved or standing before Ea and in. Some instances, even equated with Ea himself, Adapa's act of subduing the south wind isn't just a magical feat. It's an attack on a being identified with his own god, the master of magic. This action paradoxically aligns Adapa, the archetypal exorcist, with Pazuzu, a demon known for breaking the wings of the wind. This complex layering suggests that Adapa's ritualistic prowess and his assault on the south wind inadvertently position him in a contentious relationship with his own divine patron. Moreover, the two known versions of the Adapa myth that include ritual elements potentially cast Adapa himself in a demonic light. The endings of these versions, particularly in the older edition represented in Ms. D, might be interpreted 
as incantations aimed at mitigating the chaos unleashed by Adapa's actions. This interpretation adds a layer of moral and mythological complexity, painting Adapa not just as a sage and ritualist, but as a figure whose actions straddle the line between divine wisdom and transgressive force. Mortal Adapa, who lordlike broke the south wind's wing, who ascended to heaven, so be it, who set her blowing evilly over humans, the grievous sickness that he set in the bodies of humans. Pure Ninkarak will relieve when it arises. May grievous sickness turn back. That one, may chills fall on him. May sweet sleep elude him. Happiness for humans. The narrative of Adapa encompasses his two notable deeds, incapacitating the wind and his ascent to heaven. The text continues, using a similar syntax and reminiscent language to the Atrahasis, suggesting that Adapa might be implicated in the origin of diseases. Just as in Atrahasis, wind imagery is used, and the term tebu associated with the emergence of malevolent forces and often linked to the South Wind and Adapa's act is mentioned. The narrative ends with a curse, possibly directed at Adapa himself, leaving readers to ponder his role in these calamities. Adapa stands as a symbol of the potential dangers inherent in ritual performance and linguistic prowess. Within the Mesopotamian scribal tradition, the primary myth of Adapa presents a paradox figure who embodies both absolute obedience and a latent threat, his mastery over words and rituals consistently pushing beyond their intended limits. The most resonant aspects of the Adapa and the South Wind myth in relation to ritual and broader cultural narratives are his flawless execution of rituals and the inherent disruptive power of those very acts. This ambivalence reflects a broader message Mesopotamian contemplation of ritual as both a source of disease and a means of cure, highlighting the dual nature of power. Politically, Adapa's narrative portrays a servant whose perfect allegiance poses a risk of usurping his master's authority. Historically, this mirrors the actual shift in Mesopotamian society, where scholars, symbolized by figures like Adapa, rose in prominence and influence, potentially challenging the established order. A History of Adapa and the Apkalu. The narrative of Adapa reflects an evolving history of identifications, expanding from the old Babylonian period onward. Initially, Adapa epitomized the ideal ritual performer and speaker, a model for experts in the field. By the time of the Sumerian texts, from this period, Adapa was already a persona utilized by exorcists for banishing demons. And the oldest rendition of his myth concludes with an incantation, tying him intrinsically to ritualistic practices. Adapa's role in myth and ritual portrays him as a mediator, navigating the realms between heaven and earth and blurring the lines between the human and the divine. In the Udug, hull-type rituals, he is invoked as a messenger for the god of exorcism, Asaluhi, illustrating his early personification and significance. This representation of Adapa continued to evolve and spread, finding its way into Arcadian scholarly texts of 14th century Egypt. Centuries later, in the Neo-Assyrian period, Adapa's image underwent a significant transformation as he began to be paralleled with the king in royal inscriptions and correspondence. The king's actions, wisdom, and even familial attributes were likened to those of Adapa. This comparison wasn't merely about the individual, but reflected the evolving self-image and persona of the Assyrian king as a figure deeply connected to the divine, embodying special piety and ritual prowess. In the broader context of Akkadian texts, wisdom is often associated with the king, particularly in relation to acts of temple building and restoration, blending political power with religious devotion. This backdrop sets the stage for Adapa's emergence as a figure 
of political significance. This connection is epitomized by Assurbanipal, the scholarly Neo-Assyrian king who adopted the virtues of Adipa, known for his reading of cuneiform, his scholarship, and his interpretation of astronomical omens. Adapa's role underwent a significant expansion in the first millennium BCE, largely due to the rise of pseudepigraphy and a growing emphasis on writing and authorship, as noted by Dr. Van der Torn in 2007. This period didn't see the abandonment of Adapa's old exorcistic functions. These continued to be evidenced in texts such as the Udug Hul and Lamashtu series. However, a novel utilization of Adapa emerged in the form of letters containing incantations, which resonated with a wider Near Eastern literary tradition of divine correspondence. These medical incantations trace their lineage back to earlier dialogues between gods in Sumerian texts, indicating a long-standing tradition of divine communication. Dr. Van der Torn points out a significant cultural shift in Mesopotamia, an increased focus on the concept of writing and authorship, particularly evident in the first millennium BCE. This is reflected in the evolution of Adapa's image, from catalogs listing authors and ancestors to letters used as a medium for conveying supernatural knowledge. This period marks the transition from oral traditions to written communications attributed to renowned figures figures like Adapa, thereby elevating him to the status of a pseudepigraphic author. During the Neo-Assyrian period, a theoretical shift began where sages, previously confined to myth and ritual, started to be historicized. This transition fully materialized in the Seleucid period, after the end of native Mesopotamian kingship. The human sages, or Umanu, first appeared in Neo-Assyrian king lists, and the supernatural Apkalu were named and associated with legendary and historical kings in the Beat Messeri incantation fragments. While Mesopotamian kings retained their thrones, Apkalu remained within the realms of myth and ritual. However, after the cessation of native kingship, these non-human supernatural sages, including figures like Adapa, began to be integrated into historical records. They were listed alongside rulers in king lists, and Adapa himself was attributed with the temple building activities traditionally reserved for kings in places like Uruk, demonstrating a profound shift in how these ancient figures were perceived and remembered in Mesopotamian culture. The evolving nature of king lists in Uruk, transitioning from royal to scribal genealogies, underscores their dynamic role as political documents. This shift aligns with the changing power dynamics in Mesopotamian culture, particularly under the new rulers. This reordering reflects a deeper societal valorization of scholarly and scribal heritage over traditional royal lineage, indicating a significant cultural and political shift. The correlation between the elevated status of sages in historical texts and the prominence of the Ashipu exorcist in society becomes particularly evident during the Seleucid period in Babylonia. The Ashipu, among various priest experts, emerges as a notably important figure, even more frequently mentioned than astrologers across various Hellenistic Babylonia centers. This prominence suggests a growing respect and need for their expertise and roles within society. In Seleucid Uruk, a tangible connection between Mesopotamian ritual practitioners and the mythic Apkalu, especially Adapa, starts to crystallize. The ritualists not only operated a vast shrine attributed to Adapa, incorporating him into their rituals and genealogies, but they also adopted the Apkalu as a personal emblem. As Dr. Wallenfels noted in 1993, it seems that a scribe would typically adopt an Apkalu, seal upon achieving full status within the temple hierarchy. While these seals weren't exclusively used by scribes, their prevalent association with them is undeniable. This practice reflects a broader trend where apprentice scholars, as they advanced in their careers, would assume the image of the mythic sage. It symbolizes their transition into a position of wisdom and authority, paralleling the journey of the Apkalu and Adapa themselves. This trend illustrates not just a personal or professional 
professional milestone, but a deep cultural connection to the mythic past, where the lines between the historical and the divine were intricately woven into the identities of the scholars of the time. What have we learned? Mesopotamia is known for its two detailed narratives of heavenly ascent, the epic of King Etana and the myth of the sage Adapa. The story of Etana riding to the heavens on the back of an eagle was a well-established motif by the old Babylonian period, subject to various interpretations and revisions over time. However, as the story became more fixed, Etana's character seemed to diminish in cultural significance. In the realm of ritual, references to Etana are primarily found in old Babylonian Sumerian texts, with his presence fading significantly in later periods. During the old Babylonian period, Etana held considerable religious importance, often invoked in Sumerian prayers and associated with the underworld alongside the figure of Gilgamesh. His religious significance, however, was largely posthumous. As a mortal king, Etana had to die and secure a place in the underworld to become ritually relevant in the human realm. Similar to Gilgamesh, he was primarily called upon to act within the netherworld. Following the old Babylonian era, Etana largely fades into obscurity, remembered mainly as a spectral figure of ancient lore. In contrast, Adapa's narrative endured and flourished throughout Mesopotamian history. Despite being mortal in certain myths, Adapa's legacy as a semi-divine, sage with ambiguous origins, allowed him to maintain an active role beyond his lifetime. His ability to be invoked in medical emergencies and political discourse ensured his continued relevance. Adapa was not just a character in literary texts. He was a living part of Mesopotamian culture, personified by scribes who saw in him a hero and a model. His presence in rituals and historical texts, more so than in literary narratives, defines the enduring outline of his life and significance in the Mesopotamian tradition. The adaptability of Adapa as a persona to be adopted, particularly by kings, underscores his profound impact on Mesopotamian culture. Far more kings chose to align themselves with Adapa rather than Etana, highlighting Adapa's prominence in Neo-Assyrian royal propaganda. While there is no direct evidence of kings adopting his role in rituals, the extensive comparisons drawn between kings and Adapa, especially by rulers like Assurbanipal, indicate that such analogies went beyond mere flattery. Asurbanipal's inscriptions elaborate on his parallels with the sage, emphasizing his scholarly prowess, his understanding of cosmic secrets, and his esteemed place among the wise. Claims of descent from sages and Adapa in royal correspondence further illustrate how deeply entwined these figures were with the royal identity and persona. Adapa's significance extends beyond his role in myths and rituals. His story reflects the broader history historical shift in how ancient traditions were adapted into new genres and reshaped to serve evolving purposes. Following the Neo-Babylonian period, as the traditional role of court scholars in producing royal propaganda and politically oriented knowledge waned, they sought new avenues for their expertise. This period saw the emergence of new genres and the repurposing of old traditions for different ends, such as the Uruk prophecy, which utilized political tactics to promote the worship of Anu in Uruk. The rise of Adapa in cosmic and architectural narratives, particularly in the context of the Resh Temple, is part of this broader transformation. The construction of the Resh Temple, featuring the largest ziggurat ever discovered in Babylonia, occurred during a Hellenistic revival led by the Seleucid rulers and priestly governors of Uruk. This era, long after the fall of Babylonian kingship, demonstrates the enduring legacy and continual reinvention of Mesopotamian traditions. With figures like Adapa at the forefront of this cultural and scholarly evolution, the revision and evolution of Mesopotamian tradition gained momentum after the loss of native kingship during the Persian period and flourished further under the Seleucids. The construction of the Resh Temple, a monumental structure unprecedented 
in scale in Babylonia, attributed to Adapa and initiated by a governor of priestly descent, marks a significant moment in this transformative era. In this context, Adapa was not only associated with the physical structure of the temple, but also integrated into its rituals, particularly the New Year's festival, and was even included in a contemporary king list from Uruk. The Seleucid rulers seem to encourage a renaissance of traditional religious practices and forms in the ancient Mesopotamian cities, particularly Uruk and Babylon. This revival might be perceived as an invention of traditions by the new rulers to support their ideological agenda. However, it's essential to consider that the natives themselves, not just the colonizers, played a crucial role in this process. The newly formed memories and roles of sages like Adapa incorporated and reinterpreted ancient material into a new cultural and architectural paradigm, symbolized by the grandeur of the Resh Temple and its ziggurat. The exact cognitive and ritual mechanisms behind this identification with figure like Adapa during the Hellenistic period remain elusive. While exorcists might claim to embody mythical figures and incantations are replete with assertions of identity, the historical, personal, and cognitive implications of these ritual roles are not fully documented. The absence of personal accounts or diaries leaves a gap in understanding the subjective experiences of these ritual practitioners. However, while the inner experiences of these ancient scholars remain beyond our reach, the scripts for these experiences are accessible by examining texts related to self-identification and ritual participation in both Judea and Mesopotamia. It's possible to understand how ancient religious traditions were invoked and adapted to contemporary contexts. This approach can reveal the positions performers assumed when interacting with tradition, offering insights into how a scholar might ritually connect with their written culture and, in doing so, embody and perpetuate the legacy of heavenly sages like Adapa. What captivates the mind when considering the era leading up to Enoch is the remarkable spread of this literature, even in the absence of its original patrons. From the dethroning of the King of Babylon to the rise of Persia and the advent of Alexander the Great's Hellenistic era, the temples stood tall and the priesthoods flourished, their influence expanding in certain regions. In the absence of a central monarch, the scribes themselves sometimes assumed the central role, becoming the custodians of knowledge and authority. As the late Jonathan Z. Smith astutely observed, the emergence of apocalypticism seemed intrinsically tied to the decline of native kingship. A noteworthy artifact, the King List from Uruk, catalogs the names of the early kings alongside their esteemed sages. These sages were not only repositories of secret knowledge, but also wielders of healing arts and the power to exorcise demons. Among these malevolent entities, one finds the infamous Lamash II, a demon known for abducting and causing harm to newborns in ancient Mesopotamia. Intriguingly, this figure serves as the ancestral precursor to Lilith, a prominent character in Jewish law, often portrayed as Adam's supposed first wife. In a society steeped in misogyny, the moral of this cautionary tale echoes. Refrain from engaging in contentious arguments with your husband, particularly when the dispute revolves around matters of intimacy. I trust you grasp the underlying message. In the midst of this rich jumble, one figure emerges as a hero in the face of Lamashtu's malevolence, Adapa. Revered in their tradition, Adapa possessed the rare ability to ward off the menacing demon. Illustrated in a remarkable plaque dating from the 9th to 7th century, we witness the sage Adapa, adorned in an attire reminiscent of a fish, valiantly protecting patients or expectant mothers from the demon's harm. Delving into the complex depths of ancient Mesopotamian lore unveils a world where scribes rose to prominence, demonic forces loomed, and heroes arose to confront them. It is a testament 
present to the intricacies of historical narratives, where the interplay of power, mythology, and cultural beliefs shape the collective consciousness of civilizations. The intriguing question at hand revolves around the interactions between Juden scribes and Mesopotamian traditions, particularly considering the striking resemblances between the narratives of Adapa and Enoch. Both figures emerge as celestial messengers, hailing from primordial times, and both become personified by scribes. Despite the lack of extensive verbal overlap between the two, scholars have noted profound structural parallels, prompting further exploration into the potential connection between Enoch and the earlier Adapa myth. It is noteworthy that both Mesopotamian and Judean societies underwent similar transformations, including the loss of native kingship and the conquests by the Persians and Alexander the Great. In both contexts, scribal cultures experienced comparable changes. Professor Jonathan Ben Dove has drawn attention to the remarkable similarity between the astronomical knowledge present in Enoch and the astronomical knowledge associated with Adapa in Mesopotamian literature. These conceptual affinities, though distinct, beg the question of how they can be connected. During the late Persian period, the same individuals held positions of power in both institutions, namely those who controlled the temples and education. In Babylon, education centered around Aramaic parchment writing scribes who gained prominence due to the native Babylonian families' revolt against the Persian rulers. Consequently, Consequently, new scribes assumed control of Babylonian temples towards the end of the Persian period. At this juncture, Babylonian scholarship thrived, with scribes trained in standardized Aramaic. Simultaneously, these scribes became the teachers of Hebrew scribes, instructing them in the art of writing. Thus, it becomes evident that Hebrew scribes during the Hellenistic period adopted an Aramaic script as evident in their written works. The scholarly dominance of Aramaic practitioners extended throughout the Persian and Hellenistic empires, leaving a significant imprint on the intellectual landscape. This is corroborated by the presence of Aramaic Levi documents in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which employ a base 60 mathematical system rooted in Sumerian tradition, as well as Babylonian-style astronomy. Shared training among scholars naturally engenders shared literary ideas, further blurring the boundaries between distinct cultural and textual traditions. Interestingly, the Adapa myth from Mesopotamia and the concept of the Apkalu played a significant role in influencing the authors of the Enochian literature. The concept of the Apkalu known as the Seven Sages in Mesopotamian mythology, played a formative role in shaping the imagery and ideas within the Enochian literature. It's not a coincidence that Enoch is the seventh generation from Adam. Conclusion. As we conclude our journey through the ancient landscapes of myth and legend, we hope this expedition into the origins of Enoch has illuminated paths as ancient as they are profound. From the epic narratives of Atana and Adapa in Mesopotamia to the mysterious figure of Enoch in the Judean tradition, we've traversed time and thought to uncover the roots of stories that have shaped centuries of spiritual inquiry. We extend our heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Seth L. Sanders and his seminal work Adapa to Enoch for guiding us with wisdom and insight through these venerable narratives. His scholarship has been the beacon that lit our way through these ancient mysteries. Now, as we part ways, we invite you to take a step further and truly become a part of the MythVision family. If this journey has sparked a flame of curiosity and a thirst for deeper understanding within you, consider supporting our mission by becoming a Patreon, joining the YouTube membership, or offering Offering a one-time support through the links in our description, you help us continue to unearth profound stories and share these enlightening experiences with you and the world. Engage with us further in the comments section below. Share your thoughts, your questions, and the insights you've gained. Your participation is what makes this community a rich tapestry of inquisitive minds. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe to Myth Vision Podcast on YouTube. Your support is crucial in helping us bring more enlightening content to light. Every like, 
subscription, and contribution makes a difference in our quest to explore the depths of mythology and history. Thank you for being an integral part of this exploration. Together, as a community of seekers and scholars, we continue the quest for understanding that connects us all across time and tradition. Until our next adventure, keep seeking, keep questioning, and be part of the living history that is MythVision.